Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Beaks Financial Cloud Group PLC Interim Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted any time via the Q&A tab situated in the right-hand corner of your screen. Simply type in your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it received during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard and you also get notification when they're ready for your review. I'd also like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Gordon MacArthur, CEO and Fraser McDonald, CFO of Beaks Financial Cloud Group PLC. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, Gordon MacArthur. Um, uh, so I, I'm going to start off the presentation today and then we'll hand over to Fraser to do some numbers. So um, I'll do a, a brief overview of the company. I think you know, some of the shareholders or people on the call might know us, may, may know us already, but there, there might be some new folks. So um, it's a big financial cloud. We are a, a cloud computing uh, organisation who solely focus on financial markets. Um, and when I say cloud computing, um, our strap line is, is now threefold. We, our strap line is uh, we build, connect, and analyze um, financial market footprints. So if you look on the, the first slide, um, our business model is actually relatively simple. So um, we offer cloud computing capabilities in financial data centers around the world. So our cloud computing capabilities are to start with in the build component, uh, we can build you server uh, footprint, be, uh, be it dedicated, bare metal servers, or virtual private servers, mm -hmm. or virtual machines in uh, our data centers, which is no different from a generic cloud provider like an AWS, a uh, Google, or an Azure. We can give you the same portal-based ability to build, delete, and manage compute resources in our data centers. So that is not a differentiator, it's just part and parcel of what we do. So that's about the build piece. Um, second piece is a connect. So this is where we start getting into our, kind of our niche service offering and, and, and why we exist as a business. So when we say connect, we talk about private connectivity between our cloud infrastructure and financial markets ecosystem. So that could be a bank, an exchange, a broker, a technology provider. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about connect, it's a connectivity within a data center. So and you can see from the first slide, we're we're now at 19 data centers around the world. Um, and those that know us know this story fairly well. We we don't pick generic data centers. We are either in an ex uh, an exchange data center or a financial data center. And financial markets participants tend to congregate into these data centers. So when we talk about connectivity, what that means is we deploy our infrastructure, our cloud infrastructure, in the data center. We then run fiber across and inside the internal data center roof and down directly into the exchange. So that gives us point-to-point, -point secure, private, reliable, and fast connectivity between our cloud and whoever you need to talk to within that financial ecosystem. So we have got about 250 venues on net around the world. Some data centers have more than others, but that means you build your inf server infrastructure via a portal. You pick who you want to connect to. That's all uh, built for you um, in almost real time, and you get your um, server and your connectivity to do whatever type of capital markets activity you want to do. The last piece of the strap line is analyze. So um, for you, those that have been following us for a while, you, you will know that we acquired a, a business called Velocimetrics around a year ago. Um, and that has now been rebranded into Beaks Analytics. And that gives us that analytics capability. Um, so when we talk about analytics, it is you know, looking at in real time at network, the financial network. Um, monitoring it for latency, monitoring it for performance, but actually goes a lot deeper than that. So it will allow people to um, measure trade execution between uh, themselves and a venue. It will allow sell side venues to check that they've not got stale pricing in the market, that some of their, you know, the the feed pricing is is not down or is not stale, which allows them to get picked off. So we um, build, connect, analyze is really a, a strap line to the, the financial markets community. 
Um, the first slide kind of breaks down our, our business model. Uh, it's a recurring revenue business model. The majority of it is. I think we're over 90% uh, recurring. Um, we've got quite a good split by geography, um, as you can see from the charts. The the focus of the business has been institutional business for many years now. We still have a retail segment where you know a, a client can come in over the internet and buy a VPS from us um, to run a, a retail trading platform, and that's a steady business. But it's not it's certainly not the um, where we are uh, you know focusing on the majority of our investment. So. And then that last pie chart just shows you the rough breakdown between our different um, business lines. So the next slide, um, the map that we show all the time um, and every presentation is, is getting busier every time we show it. So we're at 19 data centers around the world now. Um, you know, as we go, in to go through the, 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 the period, you'll see that we've added quite a lot of data centers over the last year. Um, we have just signed for two more, um, our first venture into Canada uh, on the back of a customer contract. So we are going to have um, primary and redundant um, data centres in Toronto. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the map's getting fairly full. I think if you look at, if you look at, the, look at the map, I think the only major areas that we don't have a presence are South America and uh, kind of South Africa as, as, as you know, trading um, venues. So... We are getting to a point where I don't think we'll see as many new data centres, uh, you know, that we've put online in the last 12 or 18 months. That certainly won't be replicated going forward. We will increase capacity as we need to, but in terms of new rollouts, that will uh, that will minimise. So if we go on to the next slide, um, this is we're starting to kind of look at the first half. So um, I think the, the phrase we're using is solid. I think. There was there was good parts of it, um, and there was some frustration around some of the, the deliveries in COVID that we'll come into. So, you know, at high level, revenue is up 24%, um, EBITDA up at 11%. We've got a slight drag in profit, which is due to um, some of the challenges around COVID. Also, as, as we flagged in the last um, presentation, you know, we had a 12-month investment phase into Beaks Analytics, and we've got a, a big new private cloud project that we will be uh, have been invested in and we're hoping to launch in the summer so um but we'll, we'll cover more of the numbers as, as we go through and fraser will pick some of that up i think yeah so i mean i think it was it was it was a good half i think we uh the frustration was we have had some well covid has not affect our effect, affected our underlying markets it has affected our ability to take some of the big contracts we signed last year and it's extended the the period between signing of a contract and billing it. So we know a software company. You know we sign a contract. We have to either build a, an infrastructure or give the client the logins to the existing infrastructure before we can start billing them. So I think if you look at one of the big million dollar a year annualized contract that we signed, and this time last year, and slightly before that. It's taken us almost 12 months, or it has taken us 12 months to get that to a point where it's actually fully billed. And the reason behind that was, as part of the contract, there was six new data centres, um, and we basically signed the contract at the tail end of the year. We ordered the hardware that all arrived in Glasgow um, come around March, um, and the world stopped allowing travel, right? And our, and our business model, or the way we build out a data centre is, we do a little bit of the work in the Glasgow head office, and then we send some of our staff who will go and work on site for three, three or four weeks in the data centre, building up the infrastructure, applying all the configuration, doing the, you know, the big tests that we need to do before we can sign off as fit for purpose to allow clients on. So we simply weren't allowed to, couldn't do that. So... A lot of these geographies were new to us. We had to find remote representatives in the geography. We had to use them to do the install. We have to get, you know, do remote configuration with them helping us. And, the, and these people with the best will in the world don't really understand our technology set because it is a little bit different. So it just elongated that process. So I think we've been asked by a lot of our institutional investors this, this week, how much do we think we co it cost us? And, Finger in the air, you know, it probably costs us about 300 grand onto the bottom line. That that 
delay around COVID between getting contracts signed and, and getting them um, billing and delivered. So that was a sense of frustration. Uh, luckily, we have done the, the initial build out of sites is the most uh, the most difficult as we've done that. Um, we've still got the challenge of Toronto, which we'll, we'll, we'll be working on in the next few weeks and months. Um, but I think on the flip side is, as we announced with results, uh, one of our biggest clients, has doubled down on the commitment. You know, I think when we, we talked about it last time when they signed that first million dollar a year annual contract, that was the first phase of which we expect three or four. They have signed that second phase and that will be much quicker to deliver. So I think we're going to go from a million annualized to two million annualized actual billing, which is the important part for us, um, by the end of our financial year. So, you know, and again, we expect that contract to materially increase um, even from now. So there's there's a there's a pit, strong pipeline of opportunity with, it, with that particular client. Um, so I, I think again, those of you that have um, been uh, following us for a while have, have listened to us talk about the tier one opportunity for quite some time. So I think more positives are we now have nine tier one organisations that we are contracted directly with i.e. we they sign contracts with Beaks. I mean we've actually got a few more that are, you know, using our services via third party application providers, but when we talk about tier one clients in our presentations, it's it's those that have direct contractual relationships with us. Um so we've got nine in various stages of um maturity, some are in, you know, proof of concept stage, small, tiny initial rollouts, some like the ones that we announced um on Monday are now into the second phases of their deals, and again we announced a, you know, an extension of the open banking one that we signed last year, which we, again we hope will will grow in, in size, shape, and scale even from the the extended amount they've signed up. So, and we've got a, a you know a few quite a few um, tier one organisations that we are in discussions with, some of which we will hope to contract with some. May not, but uh, you know we are constantly trying to uh, increase the amount of tier ones in the pipeline because it does give us that land and expand capability as we are as we are seeing. So it's a kind of validation of a strategy so far that um, once we do get into these accounts, you do a good job, you deliver as you said, you give a scalable, secure, resilient solution, and you find more opportunity. Um, last piece um, on on this slide is our um, a key metric that we measure at the board is our ACMRR, so our annual contracted monthly run rate. Um, so that is what has cost what contracts have customers signed. That's not to say what has been billed. So there's a, there's always a lag. Um, we you know we have talked about you know looking at a billing metric as well. But that ACMMR, ACMRR was at 12 million at the end of December. With some of the, the we've had a really strong um, period since then. I think we we talked about in the, in the release on Monday. So we're just slightly under 13 million um, for uh, our ACMRR as as of Monday of of, of this week. Um, so the, you know there's real momentum in the business. I think you know it's it's the strongest quarter we'll have ever, ever have had, um, and uh, we see momentum going into that our Q4, which is the next quarter that takes a year. So, we, last year we talked about the year of people. We are, you know, we be, not quite doubled our headcount, but there was a significant increase in our headcount. We're about seventy-five people around the world now, give or take. Um, and then after, that was to support the growing tier one opportunity. We certainly won't replicate that over the next one to two periods. There'll be a, a, a gradual, more incremental increase in headcount as is needed. Um, but we took a lot of that pain, and you know, over the last. Uh, 18 months. We have, this year is a year of product, right? And, and I think we've talked about this before as well. So when we acquired, I'm going to call it Beaks Analytics. Um, so Beaks Analytics um, was a software product. Um, when we acquired it, one of the key intentions was to make it available on our Beaks infrastructure as a SaaS product. We have done that already and. We announced in December, I believe, that uh, it was available in our London and New York data centres, which are our two biggest presence. So that's, a, a, you know, instead of selling it to a bank or a big broker as an enterprise software or appliance-based sale, we now 
just ask them to connect directly to our infrastructure and we offer it as a service. They don't need to worry about hardware upgrades, don't need to worry about capacity, and we've got a, a simple month-to-month -month charging mechanism all based around the capacity they need on that system. So that you know that's a you know that was a really quick turnaround from uh, acquiring the business to getting some joint value to our customers. Um, we also have a, a very large private cloud network. You know, it's been based on our network automation project that we've been working on for last year. We're about three months away from from release, releasing that, and it's you know kind of phase one um, guys, if you like. Um, and we see some very significant opportunity around it. Still kind of commercially sensitive at the moment, but we hope to make some announcements around that in the next uh, three to four months. Um, okay. Um, I think we've kind of covered the land and it's expand success. So, you know, we've got a case study in here with IPC, one of our one of our larger clients and actually partners now. You know, we've we, you know, got a really strong relationship with them. Um, so, you know, we have built them a private, a global private cloud. Um, we've got, they're a, a technology company. So IPC have two main parts of the business. All the big trader voice turret systems that you see on trading floors. IPC dominate that market, and then they've got a, a financial extranet network that supports both voice and data traffic um, linked to the trader turrets, but also for transiting market data and financial data. Um, so, you know, we have we have built them a, a global private cloud. Um, they are now, we are now working with them closely. I think, you know, they've made no secret of it. They have a, a, a business unit called Connexus Infrastructure Services, which is them bundling their networking capability and our infrastructure service capability and allowing clients, their existing clients, to buy it under an IPC contract with one, you know, we've integrated support desks um, and, you know, they're they are promoting that quite heavily and, and it's all powered by Beaks. So it's a great success story for us. Um, it's grown and will continue to grow over the next period. All right, I'll pass over to Fraser to talk through uh, some more detail on the numbers. Okay, um, good afternoon everyone. Fraser McDonald, um, Chief Financial Officer of uh, Beaks. Um, I guess, you know, before we delve straight into the numbers, I thought it might be helpful just to give a bit of background and context in the last six months. And, and Gordon's actually covered uh, quite a bit of this already. Um, I think part of the... Um, the fact that we've we're kind of a week into a roadshow, we know what each other are going to say uh, quite a lot of the time. So he's he's stolen a bit of my thunder here, but I'll I'll give you a bit of a, I'll give you some of the metrics that we've touched on. So the the, the graph really depicts there that the you know the, the difference between what Gordon was mentioning that you know the, the annual value of our our signed contract with IPC, which is the you know the higher blue line there, and then the yellow line is is depicts you know the value of what we invoiced uh, over the period. Uh, and then the, the blocks are, are, are investment or the are cumulative capex spend. And as, as Gordon mentioned, um, you know we, we have faced some challenges over the last year, and that prolonged period of almost a year in, in terms of built, uh, you know signed to, to recognise revenue, you know is something that you know would, would not be typical of, of a contract. Um, so it took us uh, almost a year, um, as at the end of February, we were at 90% of that initial contract billing. So I suppose that's the, that's the downside. But as Gordon's mentioned, on on, the, on a positive note, you know we have we have delivered, we have opened the data centres, the seven data centres, the customers happy, and as a result of that, as, as Gordon mentioned, uh, we announced on Monday that the, the, the customer has doubled down on the initial contract value. So we're now over you know, two million dollars annualised. Uh, so you know again. But one of the biggest ever customer uh, deployments we've made, and we've proven we could execute it uh, during a, a difficult period. So, so it's been a good, it's been a good result. And then again, just echoing what Gordon said, you know, we we don't we don't see envisage the same problems in terms of the the second part of that contract. You know, we have customer orders dates uh, in line for that second part. So, in terms of the the, the sort of lag of sign to recognise in the second part of the period, we don't expect the same delay, so we expect that margin to be uh, generating uh, better in the second half as we did in the first half. Okay. So again, next slide. So as Gordon mentioned, last year we, we you know we made a, a, a huge increase in, in investment into our people, uh, whereas this year is we're calling it the year of product. Um, and over the last six months, we have made significant investment, um, over £2 million across 
kind of the two project that, that, that Gordon called out there, the, the Beaks Analytics, mm. uh, which is the, the previously what the Velocimetrics was, and then on our network automation as well. So over those over those two projects, we've we've spent about one and a half million pounds, uh, as as we said we would. Um, in terms of the Velocimetrics business, again, when we when we bought it, it was a privately run company, fairly bootstrapped. We we talked for those of those of you who who, who heard us at full year results that we'd invested about a million pounds, uh, both in in, in staff and uh, investment in product and the supporting infrastructure. So we're kind of you know fairly well into that journey. And as as Gordon mentioned, we have released the first. Um, Product of that that um, cloud-based uh, analytics uh, uh, back in November, and then again in terms of the network automation, that's another area that we continue to, to invest in. It's how we differentiate from our competitors um, by offering a true cloud model to allow customers to to, to manage their own infrastructure. So again, there's there's, there's been investment uh, in, in the last six months in that, um, and then the cash flow on the right there that that, that really just shows our you know our investment. So. We'll come on to our operating cash flows, but in terms of what we've created, so operating cash flows of about one and a half million in the period, but we've invested more than that. We invested just over two million, uh, you know, in product uh, and, and capacity to support that. And then the other thing that's worth highlighting for those who are not aware that we actually did receive a, a two million pound grant from um, the Scottish government to help support that network automation program. So we're actually seeing some of that money coming in, and we will do over the next year and a half uh, to help fund that. Okay, just um, coming on to the income statement. So again, um, you know, we're calling it a solid year. We are 24% up on, on, on revenue year on year, so up from 4.3 to, to 5.3 million. And as a result of that, uh, gross profit is up 400k, so about 18% on, on last year. Um, gross margin is, is down slightly on prior year, but again, reflecting the fact that you know we have made quite a bit of investment in the business over the last six to 12 months. Um, we, we opened seven data centres last year, so there's a slight um, lag on prof, you know, gross profit margin uh, on that, as, as we'd expect. Um, and again, reflecting the level of investment we've made across the, the, the capital base. But overall, our, our gross margin just under 50%. And again, we'd expect second half that that, that starts to, to uptick a bit because less investment in terms of the, 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 the data centres opening, as Gordon mentioned. So we expect that to start coming up a bit. And then again, in terms of operating profit, um, we, are, we are slightly down. Um, so it's 4% if you look at the operating profit margin and PBT margin, which again in quantum wise is around about 200k. But again, if you if you reflect back on, you know, the IPC revenue delay and and the investment we've made in Velocimetrics, which we bought it as loss making and is still loss making, that's had a slight um, lag on on overall profitability. Um, Again, because we're a recurring revenue business, we, we expect second half waiting um, to be better because we get that um, recognised revenue that, that's higher to the to the to the sign revenue coming through. So, uh, you know, as a target for our business, you know, we look to get operating profit profit before tax round about the the mid team mid teen percentages. And again, just coming back to cash flow. So again, we've covered some of this already. Operating cash flow, you know, is, is relatively strong because of the recurring revenue model. Um, we are fairly flat on on last year, uh, at one and a half million, uh, because of the, you know, what we've talked about in terms of the the IPC contract lag and and Velocimetrics being loss making. Um, the other things I'd maybe call out on on, on a cash side is we did refinance our debt. Uh, we got better terms and when we moved to Barclay and we drew down some additional funding to support our growth, around about a million pounds. Um, you know, we are still relatively low uh, gearing as a business. We're about 0.6 times EBITDA. Uh, overall, again, as I say, we are we are down on cash. We're about 700k decrease um, um, in the period. And again, we would expect you know, similar levels of investment in, in the second half as, as we have in, in the first half as we move forward. And I'll hand you back over to Gordon. Thank you. Okay, um, so I think just the last few uh, slides to summarise, then we'll kind of open up to, to Q and A. But um, I, I think uh, you know financial markets move to the cloud is still. I mean, it's, it's not exactly mature, right? You know, there are more things moving. I think COVID has um, enhanced that a little bit. 
Um, you know, I think during the, um, and we've talked about this before as well, I think during the height of the market volatility, a lot of, a lot of bigger organisations just put the brakes on everything and, and you know, it was maintaining uh, systems and making sure things didn't collapse under the, the, the strain and load. Um, but we're seeing a lot more conversations about strategic moves from, you know, both mid-size and, and larger clients. So, you know, in terms of a sector, we're certainly not at the end of a growth growth phase, if you like. It's, it's, it's still um, still got a long way to go. Um, we are we have historically over you know, the last two or three years have been uh, you know persistently talking about the tier one opportunity. I think the, the announcements we're going to hope to make in the summer um, might be a little bit after that. It's a, it's a big project. Um, will uh, allow us to tap more into the tier one market and allow us to go after some infrastructures and some systems that were not available to us before. But uh, hopefully more of that comes summer. Um, you know, we um, we're getting dragged into more and more bits and pieces. So I think, you know, three four years ago, a hundred percent of our um, revenue was directly related to execution, trade execution, right? Trading, and whether that be retail trading or you know small brokers, mid-sized brokers, whatever, it was a hundred percent. I think what we've seen over the last, you know, with our, some of our announcements and we've made. Our use case for providing secure infrastructure in the financial data centres that has point-to-point -point connectivity resonates outside just the pure capital markets play. It's got a bigger place in that larger financial services vector. You know, we announced an open banking stroke payments um, win um, that was fairly significant for us. We are seeing, you know, some um, blockchain stroke distributed ledger um, projects and initiatives from some large clients um take starting to take shape and there's there's some good engagement there and you know the IPC stuff is you know that is voice recording and voice communication systems albeit to support financial trading desks but we you, our ability to go and have conversations outside of just pure trading as it seems to be growing which is also a positive sign increases the addressable market available to us um M &A, uh, I, it's a hard one. I think we've we've made a couple of what we class as smaller acquisitions. I think the Beaks Analytics stuff, strategically, actually quite m more important than maybe the commercials around it because it's um, it leads into a future product strategy and everything. Um, um, and it's, it's hard to say. I mean, we're always looking. I think some of the challenges are in our sector. They seem to organisations seem to go from quite small, you know, a couple of million turnover. There's not that many beaks size type organisations. They tend to go from you know a couple of million, or they're a hundred million turnover, or two hundred million turnover, or, or whatever. So we're we're not exactly in a sweet spot of of our size and and scale. So you know um, we are starting to think about you know do we look at some transformational stuff? Um, but again, that there's so much organic growth that lies lies ahead of us. We think that. It's still the same message. Does it add value? Is it growing? Is it profitable? And is it, you know, valuation not, you know, ridiculous? And um, you know, getting yes to all four of the questions is actually really hard in our world. So, um, I, the, the, you know, we are always looking. I think is the is the um, the line I would give to to answer that. All right. Um, and as I said, you know, the, the business has had its probably its record quarter. Um, we see real momentum in the pipeline. We've got, you know, land and expand opportunity with most, if not all, of our tier ones that we've already signed. We've got more uh, that we're in commercial discussions with. You know, some of the names that we now, you know, I look back at where we were three years ago when we IPO'd and, you know, our average client spend, I think, was about £1,200 a month. And uh, some of the organisations we're, you know, we're engaged with now, it's not going to happen quick, you know, it doesn't happen quickly. It's a, an iterative process, but, you know, have got the ability to spend huge sums with it. So, you know, we, uh, I think we've, we've shown a consistent performance. Um, we tend to be between 20 and 30% revenue growth every year. I think we've done that every year since we started. Um, there is the opportunity to continue that as the numbers get bigger. Um, 
you know, the, the product offering is expanding, I think, with the analytics offering, the SaaS offering and the private cloud offering that's coming in summer. You know, we have got, you know, real differentiated products rather than a service cloud offering that um, really sets us apart in the market. And, 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 and I think our, um, the way that we are tackling the market is different from anyone else in our sector at all. If you look at some of our more classic competitors, or more managed service providers than, than I would say cloud providers, and, and really we are continuing to hammer home that cloud message in the in financial markets. Um, yeah, I mean, COVID nineteen still has an impact. You know, you know, we look at the Toronto thing. We still cannot travel to Canada to to do what we need to do, so we're relying on uh, third parties. But as I said at the top of the presentation, I think um, most of our new sites are, you know, done, dusted. It's now just a case of adding capacity. So hopefully, and as the hopefully the world opens up and gets back to a level of normality, then the challenges um, of lack of travel. Um, don't impact at all. So, uh, you know, the underlying business has not been impacted, as I said, but it's just given us some operational challenges over the last over the last period. And that's, um, I think that's me. I think uh, that was the main areas I wanted to cover. So happy to go on to CUNY. Fantastic. Uh, Gordon Fraser, thank you very much indeed for the presentation. Um, ladies and gentlemen, do please continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated in the top right hand corner of your screen. But just why uh, the team take a few moments to review those investor questions submitted already. I'd like to remind you that recording this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor meet company dashboard. I'd also like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company and immediately after the presentation has ended, you will be redirected for the opportunity to provide feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations. Um, Gordon Fraser, perhaps before we look at uh, the questions that are coming during the live event, we had a, a pre-submitted question which reads as follows, if I could start there. Um, assuming part of your income is dominated in US dollars, to what extent will the adverse move in the exchange rate impact on future profitability, or is there little impact due to the matching currency costs? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to pick this one up. Um, we, we do still have a, a, a reasonably natural hedge. So, you know, around about 40% of our revenues are in dollars um, and about 50% of our cost base is in dollars. So, you know, we do have that natural hedge. You know, we, we, we do monitor it. So, you know, things like that, um, IPC contract renewal is all in dollars. Um, so, you know, we will continue to monitor it. We do have hedging uh, instruments available to us should we need to use them. We've not utilised them so far because of that natural hedge, but, you know, we, we, we do monitor it. We're in that, we're in that business, so we're, we are very much aware of it. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, gentlemen, could I just address you to the, the Q&A tab? If you could just click on that and you'll see some of the questions that we've had in during the meeting. Um, if I could just ask you to read out the question and respond where appropriate to do so, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Um, uh, it's Gordon here. I'll, I'll take the first one. So um, what competitive pressures are you facing in the markets that you're operating in? Um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, we have our what we call our classic competitors. Um, you know, I, I, I don't like calling them out on our, on our calls because, you know, um, I prefer to talk about our business rather than competitors. But, um, you know, we, we're not seeing... Um, you know, particularly new entrants into the into the the sector. I think some of the generic cloud providers are, you know, looking at you know market data storage and retrieval, but they are you know they're they're still unable to um, provide real low latency infrastructure and trade execution for for exchanges and venues. They they, they just simply don't operate in the data centres that, that these guys are in. So, you know, it, it, that was always our you know, natural, um, uh, you know, way of, of, you know, differentiating a proposition is that, you know, you can't do this, you can't do the stuff that we do with the generic cloud providers, but um, I'm not seeing any specialist entrance into the, the sector that uh, would overly concern me or, or material in, the, in, the, in the, um, the way they're doing things. Two of our larger competitors, our competitors actually merged about a month and a half, two months ago. Uh, two London-based ones, so you know we've kind of really got a, a you know two competitors, one based in New York, one in London, um, that I would say are the, the managed service providers. So um, hopefully that answers the question. Um, 
second question. Um, uh, what are other areas would you look to add to your the portfolio to up and cross sell into your clients? I mean, do you look to acquire or do it organically? Um, or um, so again, another good question. So I, I become more relevant as we as we are going to the summer. So. We're trying to build end-to-end -end capability, right? So if you look at the analytics add-on, um, it is, again, part and parcel of... We, we say to yourself, what do, what do all of these organisations, what are they trying to deliver? How can we make it easier for them? How can we pre-integrate things? How can we pre-configure things that allow clients to go and focus on their business? Um, and we are constantly, you know, asking ourselves that. Um, I think there are some value add areas um, that we are currently exploring. Um, there are some areas that we're kind of never going to go into. We're never going to be a big market data provider. Um, but you know, there are what I call financial middleware um, providers out there who can add value to our story. Um, I don't think. You know, we are building our own products, but we will also look to complement that with add-on strategic value adds that give us capability in that end-to-end -end story when we're going to talk into a, you know, a trading organisation, a bank, a broker, whatever it is. Um, and uh, you know, we're constantly evaluating it. Some are probably out of our price range, um, but it's a constant thought process. And we, we announced Kevin Covington has joined our board as an, as a non-exec couple of months ago now and and really Kevin is an industry veteran he, he, he knows most of the people in our world and, and his job is to look at that strategic M&A piece and, and that might be to say you know we don't do any but uh, you know he's he's got a big focus on it um, okay I kind of uh, next question is really again about the competitive landscape um, I, I would kind of answer that. I don't, as I say, I don't think there's any material new players that would give us any cause for concern. Um, um, so what, what can you please react what you see as your defensible moat? This is a fairly crowded marketplace. What sets you apart? I don't think it is a crowded marketplace. Um, I would beg to differ on that. Um, generic cloud is a crowded, a crowded marketplace. You know, having generic compute resources anywhere. Um, yeah, it's certainly not an area that I would I would like us to you know we certainly would look at it. Our our defensive mode is the fact that we have got two hundred connections directly to exchanges, um, banks, brokers that are all immediately available to clients. That's taken seven or eight years to put in. Doesn't just happen overnight. Um, we are in the data centres that matter. Um, again, you you need to build out specifically. So you know, if you look at a generic host or a generic hosting company or a cloud company in the UK, we really don't see them because clients know that they have to connect to the CME, for instance, right? They're trading with the CME. They have to connect to them. They want to be in the CME's data center. They come and talk to us. AWS are not in the CME's data center. They can, you know, you can connect, you can have a, um, a high latency connection from AWS to CME, but that's not really fit for purpose for trading. And um, you know, generic cloud providers aren't in the data centers, so they can't have the connectivity. So it's not a crowded marketplace at all. It's a, it's a very niche marketplace, um, and we have very well established providers. You know, there's there's a handful that are that are in our space. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let Fraser answer next one. Okay, so there's a, a question from Simon. Uh, does it make sense to continue giving a dividend, given you've got debt and will probably need to increase investment in the business for existing and new Tier 1 rollouts? So uh, this, is, uh, this is something that we have been talking about internally uh, and also with our institutional investors. That is a very good point that, that's made. Um, you know, you know, do do companies invest with us? I would doubt it for, for a dividend. So, um, you know, we have been aware of optics in terms of stopping dividends and how that may look. But um, I think it's a very valid point, uh, and I think you know we are considering uh, uh, our dividend policy. I think is the best way I would answer that. Um, 
yeah, you know, we, we've, we've, as Fraser said, just to add into it. I mean, bizarrely, I, I'm the the recipient of most of that dividend, so um, um, it's not, you know, it doesn't, it's not something that I'm overly promoting. And uh, I think um, we have been discussing it for a period. Um, our advisor's view is, you know, cancelling a dividend, or, you know, in the in the COVID period was was not a particularly um, good optic or a good look because we didn't, you know, we didn't have to cancel it because of COVID. So, um, but as Fraser says, you know, uh, the feedback from our institutional investors on mass specifically this week is, um, it's not really something that they're interested in or, or acquire, you know, a shareholder for. So, I, read into that what you will. Okay. Um, again, I think another question around margins, which. So the question is, is there an operating profit or EBITDA margin that you're targeting for the, for the mid-term? Yeah, I, I think, you know, you know, when we look back over the last couple of years, our, our margins have been relatively stable, okay, give or take, you know, a bit of timing. There is a cost to what we do in terms of we are an infrastructure business. We're not, you know, we are doing a bit of software, but we're not a, a pure software business, you know. So we, we are, we, we kind of target EBITDA sort of the mid thirties and operating profits sort of mid to high teens. But I think if we if we're doing that and we're and we're scaling up, then you know I think we are we, we are happy. And if we can eke a wee bit more out of that, then then all the better. Um, question from Roger: What is expected expenditure expenditure to complete the net network automation project? Um, again, good question. So we've we've we are <laughs> we are I hope. A few months away from a uh, uh, version one of the product, um, a private cloud product. So um, that investment cycle in terms of people to develop the product is uh, coming to an end for that first phase. Um, we fully expect there to be follow-on phases. So I, I'm, I'm, I don't think there's going to be a, a point where it just drops off a cliff. I, I think that this is the probably the biggest thing that we've ever done. Um, and give us a you know a, a huge addressable market, uh, and to tap into that doesn't you know you don't just release it and forget about it. It's it's going to be a continued expense. I think it also is a slightly different commercial model. It's it's higher capex investment on day one when we sign contracts and a lower opex. Um, um, so uh, you know th there are there is going to be some significant investment in it. Over the the period, even even after we get it live. Um, uh, next question: Do customers at each of the eighteen data centres have access to all the company services? Yes. So when we sign up a, an institutional client, they uh, sign up on the website. We approve this. We approve it. Um, they get a log into the portal, and then they can deploy infrastructure in any of our data centres around the world, and. Uh, deploy our connectivity in any of the data centers that it's available. So, but you know, by just becoming a client, you can you can spin up stuff anywhere you want. Um, next question is beyond the two tier client tier one clients you've announced previously. You've not announced any of the other seven. Do you intend to announce these contracts when they reach a, reach a certain scale or can complete proof of concept? Um, and what do you see as the average annual value of those tier ones over the next two years? Um, I mean, shouting out that we signed a thirty grand a year contract with a big organisation seems, you know, we could, you know, we could, it could be, we could be a little bit disingenuous about it by, you know, naming some of the the organisations that we've got, you know, small proof of concepts with. I, 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 it's not really our style um, because of the nature of what we do as well. A lot of our clients don't, you know, will ban us from any type of uh, announcement whatsoever. That, you know, even if it doesn't name them, it's, it's very difficult. They don't like it at all. You know, I think if they've got material contracts, you know, and there's step change in the contracts, you know, so, you know, the ones we announced, um, the big two, you know, the long term commits, they were a million a year. Um, one of them was a, a, certainly in a different sector. So, if there's something, step, you know, a step change in in, in that contract. You know, if he signed a, a contract for, you know, a 10 million TCV, we'll announce it, right? What we're not going to do is announce a 30, 30 grand proof of concept with a, a big bank. Um, what do you see the average annual value of those tier ones over the next two years? Um, 
and this goes back to why we are, you know, chasing this sector. You know, the, the, there's mega deals in here, right? You know, and, and I, you know, I don't, don't want to go into numbers because, you know, whatever we say, you kind of get, you know, that's the, the line in the sand. But, you know, some of these organisations are spending tens of millions a year on their, their trading infrastructure and um, uh, the, the data centres that we run around the world. So, uh, without giving an exact number, you know, there, there are big contracts. But again. I keep going over this. No bank or investment manager is going to give you, as a new supplier, everything, right? You have to prove your worth. There's there's a very well-worn path here. You get a small project, you deliver it. If you deliver it well, you then can have a further seat at the table. And these relationships then extend. No, we are not about to walk into one of the big banks and they're going to give us a full trading infrastructure around the world that's 20 million a year. It doesn't work like that. What they do do is say, okay, you can have up this, and then uh, you prove your worth, and then you move on. Um, I think that's the last question. Is the SaaS analytics product seen as, pu as purely a revenue generator, or do you expect to also use it as a loss leader to generate business by demonstrating the performance of clients' existing networks? That's a good question, but no, is the answer. I think, um, um, no, you know, it's it's a it's a bit of a tough call to go into a customer saying, you know, we've been monitoring your network, you're not doing very well, let us do it better. Um, I think what what the analytics does is because it's really historically been the domain of the absolute biggest organisations in financial markets. What we have seen is it opens doors for us. So we are having conversations with some big accounts that have used it, are interested in using it, know of it, but is dragging infrastructure conversations with it. And as we are going to be, our strategy is more and more to to pin these offerings together, infrastructure and analytics, we are using, we're seeing it as a real door opener into some very big conversations. Uh, you know, analytics, as we said when we bought it, for the amount of money we paid for it, I'm not expecting it to turn into a 20 million a year standalone business, but strategically, as a value add, it is way, way more worthwhile than the sum of money we paid for it, as it gives us access to a lot of accounts that have the ability to spend a huge sum of money with us um, that we simply were not at the table with. Um, so there's some more come in. Once you release the new Beats private cloud service, is, aimed, is this aimed primarily at tier one clients? Do you foresee a new cohort of clients that will unlock that currently are out of reach? Yes, yes, and all of that. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm low to go into it too much because it's still not available and obviously you know there's a wide audience for this call but um the whole point of it is is to unlock new tier one clients that um really are not that interested in having any way uh, shape or form shared trading infrastructure um and yeah they, they just simply wouldn't entertain a beaks um current um system so yes simon to answer all of the above um, which uh, sorry, I think there's another last question is from Ray, which is kind of similar. Which new areas of the market do you see the network automation project opening access to? Um, I, I, kind of similar, you know, as I reiterated, it resonates with clients with ultimate security requirements, no desire to have shared infrastructure, um, and to manage their own world. I, I think I'll leave it at that. Gordon Fraser, thank you so much for, for answering yeah, all of the questions from investors. It was a really great question and answer session, so thank you very much there. Um, Gordon, perhaps just before I redirect investors to give you some feedback, um, may I just ask you just for a few final words to wrap up? That would be fantastic. Yeah, um, so thanks for thanks for the time, folks. Thanks for the interest in the company. I think um, we've heard, you know, as to re reiterate, it was a, it was a solid period. Um, real momentum in the business and uh, we now get back to the the real world of getting eyes down focusing on, back on sales execution customer satisfaction and uh, nailing the, the the remainder of the year and um, we look forward to talking to you again in the next roadshow 
Fantastic. Gordon Fraser, again, thank you so much for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session as you'll be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback. If you've accessed the meeting from our website, the feedback page will appear in front of you. If you've accessed it via the link sent you in the email, you'll just be asked to log back in to submit your feedback. It takes just a few moments and it's greatly appreciated by the company. On behalf of Beaks Financial Cloud Group PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That concludes today's session. Thank you. Good afternoon.